Good afternoon to you. Mark Seth Hurricane Track here, Wednesday now, the 9th of July, 2025. Thanks for tuning in to today's video. We have a lot to talk about, mainly focused on what's next. And we're going to start by looking at an update from Dr. Phil Klotzbach. So let's just get right into it feet first, shall we? We shall. Here we go. So a little bit of good news. Colorado State University reducing the overall expected hurricane activity for the rest of the season, now calling for a total of 16 named storms. We've already had three, so that means that we would have 13 more to go. All eight hurricanes have yet to occur, as forecast, and three major hurricanes in total, with an eventual A score this year, the accumulated cyclone energy of 140. Now, what I want to point out about this, even going back to April with the first forecast from Colorado State, and then any other forecasts from any other entity in existence, none of those forecasts, a grand total of zero of any of those forecasts, said anything or could have said anything about what has happened just this past weekend. None of those predictors, nothing that they look at, zero information about the absolute catastrophic, devastating, life-changing, life-ending flooding that took place in Texas related to the remnants of Barry and then what happened in North Carolina. Luckily, as far as I know, no fatalities, but a lot of damage from the remnants of Chantal. None of this helps us with that, and that's a problem. This tells us that, okay, the season could be busy, but, I mean, it's already been deadly uh, to the point that it's almost hard to even think about, especially with the children involved. So just keep that in mind, all right? This stuff is interesting, it's important, but it has its place amongst everything else that we look at in this information, anything from NOAA, anything from private weather organizations to just a guy at home making a prediction off of his computer, they don't tell us squat about impacts because we don't know about those impacts until the storm or hurricane is actually happening and even in those instances it's oftentimes difficult to make predictions about exactly what's going to happen on a mesoscale meaning very small geographic area related to weather basis all right so there's my opening salvo rant for today a little bit of good news reduction in the overall activity but that doesn't help us for where we've already been it's already been deadly and we have a ways to go. So just keep all of that in mind. By the way, I'll put a link to that right there if you want to read it. There's some reasoning in here, and Dr. Klotzbach lays that out in subsequent posts. Still expecting a busy season overall, just not quite as busy. So where do we go? What are things looking like now? For the most part, it's not looking bad. We've got a pretty good area of Saharan air being ejected out. Africa's like way off the shot over here. Uh, but this is the Saharan air layer coming out into the Atlantic. Very dry, stable air. A little bit of a disturbance here in the vicinity of the Bahamas and the southwest Atlantic. Otherwise, nice and clear, some disturbed weather in the southeastern Pacific, but nothing expected to develop there. July is typically a month where we see very low hurricane activity overall. Pressures are usually really high. It's kind of hot over the continent areas and we just don't get a lot of activity on a typical basis. Now there are some Julys where it is busy. Last year was one of those. We had Barrel. 2005 we had a very busy July but this is neither of those two years. So it's probably going to be more of your run-of-the-mill fairly quiet July overall. But quiet, what does that mean? Probably no hurricanes but we have already had, remember the July 4th weekend, terrible tragedy related to the remnants of former systems. So it's all a matter of perspective and understanding the bigger picture. Vorticity signature time, I like this because it tells me do we have anything that looks like this. I believe that's the remnants of Chantal up there way up above 40 north latitude between 40 and 50. So you know it's not going to do anything else but pretty good skeletal remains if you will of what was Chantal. Uh, there's some energy associated with that disturbed weather in the vicinity of the Bahamas, but that's about it. You can see some of that stretched out, very weak vorticity 
in the tropical Atlantic, not even really much in the eastern Pacific to be concerned with. So we should be in a nice, quiet pattern for the time being. Sea surface temperature anomalies. Now, one of the things that Dr. Klotzbach cites as being a reason why we would still have a pretty busy season, there's no El Nino out here. There's a little bit of warming as of late in the extreme eastern Pacific, what we call the Nino 1, 2, and parts of the 3 areas. These are just geographic details. Don't really worry about it. But uh, we don't have an El Nino, and that is for sure. And the tropical Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf are still uh, fairly warm compared to the long-term average. But the subtropics globally up here, these high-latitude areas, they are very warm. Even the Mediterranean Sea, like, that's ridiculous over there. That's a... It's a whole other story for another day there, but when you get the subtropics this warm, it kind of throws things out of balance. You don't really focus the upward motion, the forcing, uh, and the, the overall energy. It's dispersed over a large area. It's not concentrated down in the deep tropics like we saw in other busy years like 2017. Gave us a really busy season. 2005, you know, mega season 2020. Most of the energy was down in the deep tropics here. We didn't have these blatant, huge areas of extreme positive anomalies in the subtropics. So that could throw things off a little bit. It creates instability issues. There's just a lot of mechanics that goes into this. So that when you look at a map like this, this update, and you see all those reds in the high latitudes, and there are some reds and positive anomalies in the lower latitudes as well, it's kind of that potpourri. You know, we don't really know what we're going to get. And so it leads to less confidence in a seasonal forecast. But again, remember, that's just for overall numbers and that H word, hurricanes. Everybody wants to know when's the next hurricane going to be, when really we need to be wondering when is the next major rain event going to be. Now this does tell us a little bit about possibly predicting that, because with all this warmth, as I'll show you as we move along here, here's the Gulf. Look at that. These are actual temperatures. We're talking 30 plus Celsius, upper 80s in the Gulf, all the way up here close to the coastline, 31 Celsius. Hey, my friends down there in Cajun country, Mississippi, elsewhere, wow. Like, how do you do it? When you go to bed, it must just be so sultry at night. I was just down in Pensacola with the family visiting some in-laws, and it was, it was muggy out there at night. You could feel the air. I mean, in southeast North Carolina, where I live, it's muggy here, but that's a different level. And this is hurricane fuel, but not just hurricanes. And i got to be careful about that myself. We're not just talking about hurricanes. Even weak systems, Barry, Chantal, can give us devastating impacts, and we need to work on that more and more, and I want to help to lead that charge. All right? Uh, Atlantic water temperatures rebounding. This area was chiseled away a little bit because of Chantal, but we're starting to warm back up here. Again, these are actual temperatures in degrees Celsius. We're talking 80, 81 or so right against the shelf areas, the beach areas, unless you get down to the low country where it's nice and toasty. Shallower uh, shelf water and more of it down there. Pamlico Sound, Chesapeake Bay also about 82 degrees. But look right here in the northern outer banks. If you're up there, Nags Head, Kitty Hawk area, Corolla, yikes, pretty cold. You get in the water there, you're probably going to need a wetsuit. I don't know if it's 95 on the, the strand, the beach strand there. Maybe the cold water temperatures feel good. So where does everything go from here? Well, we can look at a couple of interesting things here. I want to cite where this is coming from. This is from Dr. Michael Ventress and his website of the zonal wind anomalies. Now, what exactly is that? And why does it matter? Well, let's enlarge the picture, and I shall explain. So here's where we are now, July 9th. This is the GFS operational forecast, and this is the future, all through here. All this area, this is the past. This is where we've come from. And what we're looking at, all these blues and purples indicate strong easterly wind, meaning that it comes from the east. And then the question is, okay, we know that it's easterly wind anomalies. Where? Well, our nice interactive map, developed by our good friend over in the UK, Mr. Will Woodgate, shows us this area all through here. Strong easterly winds are forecast through these ENSO regions here. That's what's painted in with the green. So this Havmuller diagram is talking about the tropics. 
and the zonal wind anomalies. And all that blue and purple says we should get cooling in the equatorial Pacific. So going back to this map, that means that eventually, over the next few weeks, this should start to cool off fairly noticeably. And that could have a big impact, especially, and as they say, wait for it, because the Atlantic should warm a little bit over the next few days. We've had a reduction in trade winds. That's what these colors mean. And we can see that on, again, this map over here. We'll be watching this region to see if it warms coincident with this cooling. And if that's the case, yeah, you know, the season could be pretty active once we get into the latter part of August and beyond. And that's what Dr. Klotzbach is talking about. All right. And we can see that reflected in some of the guidance, the CFS V2, amongst other models. Believe me, there's plenty of model activity tracking this stuff. But we're looking at the potential of going back to La Nina territory as we get towards the peak of the season. And that could help to give us a fairly active October. I know that's several months away, but yeah, this is stuff that we look at. And, you know, after all, it does say what's next for today's title. These are all the different things that we'll be keeping track of. In the more immediate future, I like this post. This is from our friend Eric Webb yesterday. The latest Euro weeklies are hinting at a favorable subseasonal window for tropical development in the Atlantic in and around early to mid-August. Another Havmolar diagram. This one is showing us the upper levels, this green color. This is where we are now. It's just a different way of looking at it. And this is going through time. And then this is your geographic area. You understand? So time is going into the future this way. And then you look geographically how this energy would propagate across uh, from west to east. We call this the Manjulian Oscillation. And currently we're in a sinking phase because all of this is happening right here, right now, in this time period. You understand? Out in the future, it switches to a more green color, which is favorable 200 millibar patterns, right? And... Um, so then you would think, well, we should get some activity. The forcing would be there, right? Maybe not. Uh, Eric seems to think that the um, this phase, the next phase coming up, what I just showed you, probably won't be enough to do it because of the stability issues that we're seeing in the Atlantic Basin, mainly because of all this warmth in these high latitudes up here. So we'll see if we have to uh, just keep waiting until another pulse comes by uh, down the road a piece, maybe into September. So this is what we look at, all right? This is how it all works out uh, for us uh, watching on uh, different tools. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what my next tab is going to be. And you have Eric watching it. I watch it. Lots of other people do, of course. The uh, folks at the Climate Prediction Center are keeping an eye on things. And there's a little bit of an area, I just want to point it out to you, in the northern gulf here over the next week to 10 days that has a low probability I want to make sure we make that very clear not scaring something up that does not exist low probability that's that candy cane look if you will of maybe some tropical mischief in the northern gulf uh, as a disturbance comes around and i'll be able to show you that on the gfs here in just a moment meanwhile the west pacific looks like where it will be the most busy, you get the darker red in there, which is greater than 60% probability of tropical cyclone activity. And uh, that is the beginnings of that Mount Julian oscillation that will eventually make its way westward and possibly influence the Western Hemisphere as we round out the month and get into the early part of July. So now let's take a look at the GFS. This is the operational from today. And again, that's my favorite level there, the 850 millibar level, where we are looking for that vorticity that we talk about so often. Get the color code that I want there for me. All right. Um, so here we are. This is, oh, by the way, this is easy to see stuff. There's your Bermuda High, big fat Bermuda High. And there's Bermuda right there. Kind of why they call it that, right? And the flow around this is such that it's just dragging deep Caribbean and Gulf moisture where? right into the lower 48. So that's why it is so juicy. The precipitable water values are ridiculously high. We have very warm water, warmer than average, so you're going to have a lot more moisture in the atmosphere. Just a little note there. 
So let's move this out through time and see what happens. We are at four days. There's five days. Finally, by day six, day seven, uh-oh, there's a little piece of energy sandwiched between a big fat heat ridge over here, the Bermuda High sitting out over the Atlantic here, and in between, a little piece of energy right there. Remember, Barry, Chantal, both were innocuous looking areas of energy just like this, and we will have to see what happens. This is a week out. The ensembles are starting to see it. There's a little bit of a uptick in activity on the Euro ensembles, the GFS, you name it. We're starting to see it, and then this is, of course, why the Climate Prediction Center is outlining it on their map. It is something to look for in the coming days uh, in the northern Gulf, potentially. So we'll watch that and see if it stays, if it gets more pronounced, whatever the case may be. All right, before I let you go, a reminder, yes, I do still have our paper tracking maps. Three different people emailing me over the last couple of days. They are taken care of. They got theirs. They are on their way. If you want yours, it is. It's poster size. It's a beautiful thing, sort of a lost art because we do everything on these or a screen. I mean, our interactive map. I mean, come on. That thing's awesome. But there's something really cool about plotting it yourself. And by the way, if you just ordered one and you're like, well, I missed the first three storms. Luckily, they were short-lived, so you don't have, like, multiple tens of advisories to go back and catch up on plotting the ones from before. Um, the, the first three was at Arthur and then, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Andrea. <laughs> I'm lost myself. Uh, Barry and Chantal. Easy to go back to the Hurricane Center archives and plot that and get caught up and be ready for Dexter. Yes, that's the D-Storm. I don't make up the names. I just print them on the map. And yet I forgot the first one for this year. But anyway, if you want to get one, you can click on the link right there and I'll put it, there it is for you in the description of today's video underneath the forecast update from Dr. Phil, Phil, I can't even talk, probably time to wrap it up, from Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil Klotzbach, uh, that Dr. Phil, come on Mark, let's try to get out of here, all right, there we go, uh, this is going to end up being a train wreck, so look, I appreciate you tuning in, we covered a lot, a yeah, fairly short amount of time, um, interesting stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks, and then eventually through the meat of the season, and we will keep an eye on all of it. I'll be back tomorrow with another update just to you know see what's going on. We'll keep track of that potential golf system, and we will go from there. All right? Have yourselves a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in and giving me a part of your day. From all of us at Hurricane Track, I am Mark Suttoth, and I will see you again tomorrow.